أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وهو خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد Distinguished Scholars My Respected Elders My Dearest Brothers and Sisters in Iman السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته the Al-Islah admins have once again brought to our attention the fact that another speaker has attempted to discredit some of the researches we presented in the Islah series. And uh, some of our members have also been very kind enough to provide us with a summary of the arguments and the narrations that he has brought forward. So as usual, uh, we are always very welcoming of criticism, <clears throat> constructive uh, criticism, and also even destructive criticism. Uh, by which I mean <laughs> personal uh, attacks, character assassination, all of that we don't mind. In fact, the personal parts of the assault, we tend to respond to with the words of our great-grandfather, Al-Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein, Zain al-Abideen alayhi salatu wassalam. When he was uh, done performing tawaf of the Kaaba, a person came and launched into a vicious tirade against him. Uh, accusing him, character assassinating him. Imam patiently heard, listened to all of that. And then he said, Kullu ma fiya, wa ma khafi anka azam. He said, everything that you mentioned about me, I accept it as being true about me. I'm not going to uh, reject it or to abuse you and uh, attack you and character assassinate you in return. Rather, everything you've said about me is true. وَمَا خَفِيَ عَنْكَ أَعْظَمَ And actually, what you don't know about, <clears throat> about me is even greater than what you know about me. Meaning what you've presented is nothing compared to what you've not presented in terms of my weaknesses and my uh, negative attributes and traits. So this was the humility of Imam, obviously. Otherwise, he was, um, he was a paragon of virtues and excellences. In our case, we are not even that paragon. Yet, uh, it befits us to not respond uh, to personal attacks with more than what the Imam said. So also we say, Whatever personal attacks you launch against me, we accept them as they are. And that's also very true. What you don't know about us is greater than what you do know, what you do know about us. And then after that, the Imam proceeded to tell him that, is there anything I can help you with? So in the case of this speaker, um, we don't need to ask him because apparently what we have in front of us, what he has presented, does give an indication that he needs a lot of help from us. So inshallah, we will offer that to him as well as all others who have been confused by what he has sub uh, submitted in his uh, presentation. So the first thing I want to clarify is that uh, he operates on a misconception, a very critical misconception and misperception. So when he launched into this um, attack on me, I think he was presuming uh, or rather, right, he was assuming that uh, this claim, so the thing that he was really mad at us for and really angry at us for was our indication in the response to one of the questions that was given to us. First of all, the idea, our claim that the hadith of Mamata, walam ya'rif imam zamanihi mata mitatan jahiliya, person who dies without recognizing the imam of his time, dies a death of ignorance. So we had said that the evidence used to support this narration and the chains of this narration are not of the kind that they that they are acceptable or that they are authentic uh, and reliable as far as the Rijali and Sanadi Bath is concerned. So he took exception to that, number one, uh, our claim that this is based on weak evidence. Um, but there is a larger misconception that I can sense in the presentation that he made is that he's thinking that we have emerged from nowhere. We've just plastered a doctor in front of our name and now we are coming up with new claims which have not been made by anyone before us. So we are bringing forward an innovation. And I guess, I guess that is what gave him the confidence to then proceed to bring narrations and then attack us with, with such confidence. Whereas the reality is if he had known the view that we are advancing and the research that we are sharing, where it actually is coming from, I am pretty confident and pretty sure that he would not dare to uh, go and launch in such a vicious attack and try to disprove or discredit the research we're presenting. Because the research we presented 
and the claim that we made is actually based on research that has come to us from the grandest and greatest maraji' and mujtahideen of the Hawzat of Najaf and Qum. But unfortunately, those statements that we were basing our claims on, those statements are found in their advanced level, Bahthul Kharij level writings. And because those Bahthul Kharij level writings are not so easily accessible to the masses, to the lay people, no one, obviously, lay people are not even, uh, they would never bother to read those advanced level writings. And also, many of these speakers who sit on the mimbar, they are woefully uh, ignorant and unaware. They are disconnected and detached from the best and most cutting edge researches that are going on in the Hawzat of Najaf and Qom and previously also Sham. So because of that, I have seen a trend. A lot of these people, when we come up with these uh, researches, they think we are bringing them out from thin air. Whereas the reality is we are, in many instances, we are simply putting forward and promoting the researches that have come from these great mujtahideen, which they have showcased in their advanced level Bahthul Kharij writings. So those writings sometimes they exist in the form of direct writings, which the Maraja and mujtahideen have written, yani the books that they have authored, and also transcripts of their lectures, sometimes which uh, their top students and their devoted students prepare and then present to the uh, Marja or mujtahid. He goes through it and then it is published as in the form of a taqreer which is a the official transcript of that particular dawra so in any case the the main idea with which the speaker was really upset and angry and which he then set to try and debunk uh, with the the narrations that he brought forward was this uh, idea and this claim that imama is not among the daruriyat of deen so all the mamata narrations is bringing to prove the idea that imama is absolutely non-negotiable. It is a non-negotiable requirement and an essential foundational pillar of the deen without which you cannot acquire salvation. If you die without accepting it or recognizing the imam of the time, uh, then you die a death of ignorance. And he then later explained in the light of another narration that it is a death of a mushrik. You basically die a mushrik. You don't die a Muslim. Whereas Allah has commanded us in the Quran, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not die as anything but as Muslims. So the misconception that he has is that uh, he thinks uh, that the idea that imama is uh, part of the daruriyat ad deen he feels this is an established idea within Shiaism. Whereas the reality, as we are humbly submitting, is that that is not the case. Some of the grandest and greatest maraja and mujtahideen have pointed out that the daruriyat of deen, the absolute non-negotiable, foundational, fundamental, essential, basic pillars on which the deen is based, which if you reject, you become kafir and you die the death of a kafir. The grandest maraja and ulama whose researches we have uh, seen and come across they actually list only three beliefs in most instances. They uh, list three beliefs which are Tawheed, Nubuwa and Ma'ad. They say these are the three foundational, fundamental, non-negotiable, essential uh, daruriyat of the deen, the necessary beliefs of the religion. Yani you reject any one of these three, your salvation in the hereafter is gone. You are a gone case. Tawheed, Nubuwa, and Ma'ad. But the interesting thing is that the Maraja and Mujtahideen in the Hawzat of Najaf and Qom, if you read their advanced level writings, the problem is that many of these speakers who sit on the mimbar, they're not familiar with these advanced level writings. They haven't bothered to read them and they're not aware of them. They don't know what researches are going on at the highest level. So otherwise, if they had gone through Bahthul Kharij, anyone who has gone through Bahthul Kharij would know this because as I will show you from the uh, writings and the quotations we will present, these are coming from textbooks in many instances, which are taught at the highest level of Bahthul Kharij, in fiqh, in usul. So anyone who has gone through the uh, stages would, would, know, would know of this. The fact that the speaker doesn't happen to know 
uh, of this is uh, an indication that he has not gone through these writings and this is why we are here to help him and present him those uh, uh, those references inshallah ta'ala so who says this who removes imama from the daruriyat of deen some of the grandest maraja as i said first of all we can mention the name of ayatullah al uzma sayyid abul qasim al khui he has a 50 volume encyclopedia that has been published uh, it's called Mawsu'atul Imam al khui the Encyclopedia of Imam al khui in 50 volumes. So, yeah, it is a voluminous, multi-volume encyclopedia with the... It's highly, um, highly, highly rich in terms of the research that it presents. It is well edited, well annotated, and it has the transcripts of the lectures that he used to deliver in the Hawza as well as his own writings. So, in volume 3, of this uh, massive encyclopedia if you look at uh, the part where he, uh, so the book at-tanqih fi sharh al-urwat al-wuthqa is uh, actually vol volume 3 of this encyclopedia and uh, in this volume 3 you go to page 53 where he has the mabhath on this so he talks about the daruriyat of deen the absolute essential non-negotiable usul and beliefs of deen without which you cannot be accepted as a muslim and he lists only three he says, at tawheed Nubuwa, and Ma'ad. There is no mention of Imama in the Daruriyat of Deen. So, this is Sayyid al khui His contemporary, Ayatollah al uzma as Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, was the Marja and believed to be the Alam before him. As Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, also in his uh, encyclopedia, also, uh, the commentary of Urwat al Uthqa. Urwat al Uthqa is a standard textbook of fiqh authored by Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Qadim Qabatubai al Yazdi. Uh, and many of the uh, great teachers in the Hawzat of Qum and Najaf, when they teach fiqh to their students, they teach it in light of this book. So they actually give lectures commenting on the mabahith of this book and they've also published commentaries of this book. So Sayyid Muhsin al Hakim, in the commentary of Al Urwat al Uthqa, which he has published, if you look at volume one, uh, pages uh, 378 onwards. He also talks about the absolute daruriyat of deen, the essential non-negotiable beliefs required for you to be accepted as a Muslim and for your Islam to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentions Tawheed uh, and Ma'ad, Tawheed and Nubuwa. He makes no mention of Imam. So, this is Sayyid Muhsin al Hakim. Similarly, Sayyid Abdul A'la al Sabzwari, Ayatollah Sayyid Abdul A'la al Sabzwari, in his famous book uh, Muhaddab al Ahkam fi Bayan al Halali wal Haram. In volume one of this book, page uh, 373, he lists the Daruriyat, there is no mention of Imama. He removes Imama from the list of the absolutely essential, necessary beliefs of the deen. Similarly, uh, Ayatollah al uzma as Sayyid al-Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr in his Buhuth fi Sharh al-Urwat al wuthqa which he authored himself uh, in volume 3, page 295 he mentions very clearly that Imama is not part of the Daruriyat of Deen. Similarly, Ayatollah as Sayyid uh, Muhammad Sa'id al-Tabatabai al-Hakim he is a contemporary of Ayatollah Sistani. He has studied uh, some of the under this some of the same teachers as Sayyid Sistani in the Hawza of Najaf, Sheikh Hussein Al Hilli and Sayyid Al Khoi and all these others. And he is uh, considered to me among the alam, uh, among the most learned maraji of Najaf, together with Sayyid Sistani. Some say he's the second after Sayyid Sistani in Min Haythul Alamiya. Others say some believe him to be the alam ultimately. The important thing is that he's one of the well-known maraja of Najaf and uh, he has actually authored a book. So in in his book uh, Usul, Usul al aqidah he has actually mentioned this on page uh, 47 onwards. He talks about the Usul of Deen and he mentions only three, Tawheed, uh, Nubuwa and Ma'ad. So the question is what is going on here? These top maraja and Mujtahideen and there are also many others that, that we can list uh, this is not only a Najaf thing 
uh, Ayatollah Sheikh Wahid Al Khurasani in his book Minhaj al Salihin, if you look at volume 2, page 120, he also lists, uh, he does not mention Imama among the Daruriyat of Deen. Um, uh, similarly, uh, you will find other uh, Qummi personalities, Ayatollah Al Rouhani in his. Uh, uh, Sayyid al-Rawhani in his Minhaj al-Salihin, uh, volume 1, page 26. He mentions the Daruriyat of Deen, the absolutely necessary beliefs of religion, doesn't mention Imama in it. So the question is, what is going on here? How come these great Maraja and Mujtahideen, have they not read the Manmata Hadith? Uh, have they not uh, gone through Al-Kafi and Kamal al-Din and all these other books that the speaker was quoting? Are they not familiar with these narrations? So the reality is that I think it would be an insult to the intelligences of our audience to say that they have not gone through these narrations. Of course, they have gone through these narrations. So then how come the speaker is saying something else? He's trying to bring narrations to prove that no imama is absolutely essential, non-negotiable. You die a death of jahiliya, you die devoid of Islam, you die a mushrik if you do not believe in imama. Or you don't recognize the Imam of your time. Whether the, whereas these great Marajya and Mushahideen, they are saying the opposite. They're saying, no, the only three beliefs, which if you do reject them, you end up dying the death of Jahiliya and ignorance and Kufr. And not only death, even in life, life you will be treated as a Kafir. It's Tawheed, Nubuwa, and Ma'ad. These three beliefs are what uh, the general majority are promoting. So the question is, have they not seen those narrations that this speaker was sharing? Of course, if we, uh, if we at our level have seen them, so you can imagine Bahth al <laughs> these people who teach Bahth al Kharij, then obviously uh, it cannot be argued that they are unfamiliar with these narrations. So then why is it that they are removing Imama from the essential daruriyat of Deen, whereas this speaker is absolutely hell-bent on asserting that this it is part of the Daruriyat of Deen and he brings his lining up narrations to support this idea. So the answer to this question, dichotomy, why is there this difference? To give the simplest possible explanation for it, I would say is uh, I think uh, a, a story that uh, Al-Allama Jalaluddin Suyuti mentions in his Itqan that there was a person who once went to a scholar of Quran and he challenged him. He said, this Qur'an claims that there is no contradiction in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ غَيْرِ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ أَوْ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If this Qur'an had been from other than Allah, they would have found a lot of contradictions in it. He says, I found a contradiction in it. This person, he says to the Shaykh, he says, okay, what is a contradiction? He says in Surah Al-Balad of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا أُقْسِمُ بِهَذَا الْبَلَد so he reads this ayah literally, La uqsimu bihadal balad. If you translate it literally, it, it would mean, I do not swear by this peaceful city. I do not swear. La uqsimu. But if you go in Surah al teen Allah is saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa tini wa zaytun, wa turi sinin, wa hadal balad al amin. And the wow that you see at the beginning of each of these three verses is not wow atf. It's not the wow that means and. It's wow al qasam. It's the wow that is used to indicate that an oath is being taken. So in Surah al teen Allah is swearing by, He's saying, wa tini wa zaytun, wa turi sinin, wa al balad al amin. I swear by this balad al amin, by this peaceful city. So this person says this is a contradiction. In the ayah, first ayah of Surah al balad He's saying, La uqsimu, I don't swear. Here he's saying, Wa hadha al balad al amin, and I do swear by the. So, what is it? Is he swearing by the, and is he taking an oath by the holy city and the, the peaceful city, or is he not? One place he's saying, I am, one place he's saying, I'm not. This is a contradiction, clear contradiction. So, the sheikh <laughs> smiled and he responded to him by saying, responded to him by saying, you want the general jawab first or the specific jawab? He said, I want both, the Aam and the Khas. He said, I'lam anna hadha al-Qur'an nazala fi hadrati rijalin wa bayna zahranay qawmin lam yakun ahadun min al-khalqi ashadda minhum hirsan lit-ta'ni fihi wal-ghamzi fihi wa law wajadu fihi mat'anan aw maghmazan lata'allaqu bihi ashadda ta'alluq walakinnahum sakatu wa takallamta 
لِأَنَّهُمْ عَلِمُوا وَجَهِلْتَا He says that the first general response is that understand whenever you come across something like this in the Qur'an, understand first one thing, which is that this Qur'an was revealed in the midst of the kuffar and mushrikeen of Makkah, who are the masters of their language. And there was no one among the creations of Allah who was more desperate to find a weak point or a discrepancy or inconsistency or error in the Qur'an. There was no one more desperate than these kuffar and mushrikeen of Makkah. So if they had found even a slight loophole, slight contradiction, slight discrepancy, they would, before even you would have thought of it, they would have jumped on it and grabbed it with both their hands. But the fact is, you are seeing this as a contradiction. That Allah is saying, here I'm swearing, here he's saying I'm not swearing. But those kuffar and mushrikeen of Mecca, and these, both, both these surahs are Mecca. So the Meccans, they were unable to see the contradiction, it is their language. And according to you, this is a very glaring and manifest contradiction. So, he says, but they kept quiet and you are speaking. He says, do you know why? He says, وَجَهِلْتَ Because they had ilm, they had knowledge and intimate familiarity and understanding with their language. Whereas you are a jahil, you are an ignorant person, your knowledge and understanding of Arabic is superficial. So that's why the contradiction is due to your ignorance, not because of their, not because that there is a real error. And then he goes to give the specific answer. He says, you have not understood the Arabic of this verse. When Allah says, la uqsimu, the word la, you are taking it to be la nafia. You think Allah is saying, I am not swearing. No, the rule of Arabic, the convention, the speech patterns of Arabic dictate that when la comes before uqsimu, it does not indicate negation. It indicates emphasis. This la is being used to emphasize Allah is saying, I most certainly swear by the holy city and then when he comes in surah to teen and he says al amin he's confirming what he said in suratul balad but because your knowledge of arabic was shallow you thought the law over there is la nafia it's the law used to negate so because you've studied up to a primary level you think la has only one meaning in arabic but the reality is uh, arabic is a much more nuanced language than you think it is so the same thing applies here it is not that the Grand Maraji and Mujtahideen like Ayatollah Sayyid al-Khui, Ayatollah Sayyid al-Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Ayatollah Sayyid al-Khumaini also, I, I forgot to mention him. Ayatollah Sayyid Abd al-A'la al-Sabzwari, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Tabatabai al-Hakim, Ayatollah Muhsin al-Hakim, all these grand and big names that we have quoted. And we have, uh, because today we have less time, Inshallah, if the Islah members are interested, we can actually have a whole session just on this. We bring you book by book, we show you exactly their exact statements. Inshallah, if there is time, I'll quote a few. But we can have an entire session just quoting the statements of the ulama where they have asserted that the imama is not part of the daruriyat of the deen, of the religion of Islam. It is not an essential component. But... Uh, the question that we are trying to address here is then, how is it possible? These narrations which the speaker presented, these grand marajah, they are unfamiliar. They've not read Al-Kafi. They're not familiar with Kamal al-Din by Sheikh al-Saduq. They don't know of these narrations. The answer is the same answer that that Sheikh gave. It's along those lines. The answer is these grand marajah and mujtahideen, it would be an insult to the intelligence of our Audience, if we say they don't know these narrations, 100%, I guarantee you, they know these narrations. But the reason why they don't base the claim that the speaker is basing on them is the same. As that Sheikh had said, لِأَنَّهُمْ عَلِمُوا وَجَهِلْتَ is because they have, no, they have intimate knowledge of the sources, whereas the speaker in question, unfortunately, does not have a sound grasp of the sources. He is not uh, well versed in Al Murrijal and most importantly in Ilmul Usul because the, you see, uh, riwayat are not such that you can just bring them out from the book and then there is a whole process of deduction. Al Istimbat and Istimbat and Aqaid, they are very, the bar is extremely high if you want to derive something at the level of Aqidah. In Fiqh also, it is very strict. But in Aqidah, if you want to prove something is a non negotiable, core, essential belief of Islam without which no salvation can be achieved. You think this is easy to prove. The bar for this is really high. It has been set very high by the scholars of Usul and Rijal and 
generally the scholars of Islam have been very tough. So they say that you need an evidence which is qat'iyun suduran wa dilalatan. You need an evidence which first of all you can prove with 100% absolute certainty that it has come to us from Allah and the Messenger. Number one, you should be able to establish that it is from them. And for that you need impeccable, multiple, numerous, mutawatir chains because a single chain, even if it is sahih, you feed the zan, it only constitutes zanni evidence as far as the ulama of usul are concerned. Al-khabar al-wahid al-sahih is considered zanni evidence. And I'll explain to you if there is time I'll tell you why they're not uh, wrong or they're not ignorant in making this claim that a khabar wahid sahih, even if it is sahih, everyone in the chain is authentic and reliable, has been verified by the classical scholars. They say still, this you cannot say 100% the Imam said. So now there is Hisab al Ihtimalat, as Sayyidi Shaheed then discusses in his advanced level writings. But we won't go into Hisab al Ihtimalat for now. The important thing is that the Ulama and Maraja and Mujtahideen at the highest level, they recognize the fact that you cannot prove things at the level of Aqeedah by using single chain narrations, regardless of the authenticity of those narrations or not. And we're going to show you, inshallah, the narrations that he has used. We will see what kind of chains they have, inshallah. So this is the important thing to understand is that these Ulama and Maraja and Mujtahideen who are removing Imama from the Daruriyat of Deen, it's not that they're not familiar with these narrations. If we are familiar, then you can imagine at their level, you cannot afford to not know these narrations. But the reality is they do not include these narrations in their istimbat and they don't use them to then include imama in the daruriyat of deen because these narrations, they don't represent the kind of evidence. They don't satisfy the criteria that the ulama of usul have set for accepting something as being part of the daruriyat of deen. And this is exactly, I can actually read to you the statement of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad, Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr. He puts it very clearly when he is uh, omitting and uh, removing imama from the usul and daruriyat and non-negotiable core, foundational, fundamental pillars and beliefs of the deen and religion of Islam. This is what he writes. In his Buhutha uh, fi Sharh al Urwat al Wuthqa, um, his statement is very clear. This is volume 3, page uh, 319 to 320. He says, Al Ma'ruf bayna fuqaha'ina, taharatul mukhalifina lin hifawi arkan al islami fihim. So obviously, he's discussing here the tahara of the mukhalifin. One of the things you have to understand is that it is very easy for, you, for these uh, Ahlul Mimbar and for the people who, you know, who are addressing the awam, it is very easy for them to come and start lining up narrations and saying that, okay, now we're going to uh, prove something at the level of aqidah with these narrations. It's very easy to do that. But at the level of bahthul kharij, among the mujtahideen and maraji, they have to think about the implications of everything. They have to think through each and every single aspect of the claim that they're making. So that's why they have to be much more careful and they have to be much more academic and methodical. They cannot afford to follow these unacademic and um, unprofessional approaches. So when he's talking about the tahara of the mukhalifin, he says al-ma'roof bayna fuqaha ina tahara tul mukhalifin. That the established view among our fuqaha and our jurists is that the mukhalifin, the non-Shi'as, are tahir. They are uh, pak, basically. They are pure. They're not najis. Because if you say that they have rejected an asl from the usul of deen, if you take imama to be from the asl of the usul al-deen or darura min daruriyat al-deen, then you know what's the implication. The implication is that anyone who rejects it is obviously kafir, right? And if he's a kafir, then the, the whole bahth of najasa comes in. So you have to worry about the najasa and everything. So that's why a Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, he says, no, there is no way you can say that uh, imama is from the daruriyat of deen because those who reject it, the fuqaha are saying that they are tahir. So if Imama was among the Daruriyat of Deen, that Fuqaha would not be able to say that the rejectors of Imama are Tahir, that they are pure. So he says, and actually the idea that they are pure is based on, what is the idea it is based on? On what grounds do the Ulama declare the Mukhalifin, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'a, the Ibadiyya, all the other non-Shia sects, on what grounds do they say that they are Tahir? He says, لِنْ حِفَاظِ أَرْكَانِ الْإِسْلَامِ فِيهِمْ Because the core Arkan of Islam, 
the main teachings of Islam are found in their belief system. وَانْطِبَاقِ الضَّابِطِ الْمُبَيِّنِ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فِي الْرِوَيَاتِ عَلَيْهِ Because the dhabit, the criterion that has been given even in the riwayat, not just in the Qur'an, even in the riwayat of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, so now he is actually going to quote a sahih, a really sahih. So we are saying really genuinely sahih to differentiate it from the kind of narrations which the speaker brings, which we will, we will expose their hal in a moment. But Ayatollah Sayyid al-Shaheed, he says that if you look at the authentic riwayat of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the criterion that they have given in those authentic riwayat, okay, kama fi riwayati uh, an Abi Abdullahi alayhi salam, he says, qala al-Islam shahadat an la ilaha illallah wa tasdiq bi rasulillah, bihi huqinat al-dima wa alayhi jarat al-manakih wa al-mawarith, this is the riwayah from volume 2 of Al-Kafi, page 25. So he quotes this riwayah, and this riwayah again, remember, even if it is sahih, it is only zanni evidence. Sayyid al-Shaheed is authenticating this not on the basis of it being a zanni narration, but rather what is mentioned in it is fully supported by the qat'i evidence that we get from the Qur'an. So that's why using the qarina kharijiyah, the qarina qat'iyah that's in the Qur'an, he's authenticating this narration. And he's saying that based on this narration, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is saying, Al Islam shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa tasdiqu bi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's only mentioning two, two major uh, criteria. That Islam is that you believe and testify that there is no God but Allah, and you accept and vouch and believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the definition of Islam and it's given where? In Al-Kafi. So apparently our speaker has not seen this narration perhaps or he conveniently uh, hid it. He is only presenting narrations which show that no, there are more things. But Sayyidi Shahid al-Sadr is saying no, there's a narration and this narration, unlike those narrations which the speaker is presenting, this is not problematic because this particular narration has qat'i support and qat'i proof for it. From the Quran, we can prove that this narration is true. Its content is authentic and reliable. So, citing this narration, he then goes on to say that وَيُرَدُّ عَلَيْهِ مُضَافًا إِلَىٰ عَدَمِ الْإِلْتِزَامِ بِكُفْرِ مُنْكِرِ الضَّرُورِ أَنَّ الْمُرَادِ الضَّرُورِ الَّذِي يُنْكِرُهُ الْمُخَالِفِ إِنْ كَانَ هُوَ نَفْسُ إِمَامَةِ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ فَمِنَ الْجَلِيِّ أَنَّ هَذِهِ ال وَلَوْ سُلِّمَ بُلُوغُهَا حُدُوثًا تِلْكَ الدَّرَجَةً فَلَا شَكَّ فِي عَدَمِ اسْتِمْرَارِ وُضُوحِهَا بِتِلْكَ الْمَثَابَةِ لِمَا اكْتَنَفَهَا مِنْ عَوَامِلِ الْغُمُودِ He is saying that if you are going to argue that the imama of Ahlul Bayt is among the daruriyat of deen, then this argument is untenable. It is an unfounded argument. Why? Because من الجلي أن هذه القضية لم تبلغ في وضوح وضوحها إلى درجة الضرورة. He says the claim that the imama is part of the usul al-din or the daruriyat of din, the non-negotiable beliefs of religion. This claim, the evidence that is being used to support it, has not reached. It has not satisfied and it has not qualified the criteria that have been set by the ulama of usul for something to be accepted as part of the daruriyat of deen. Fi wuduhiha. The main reason is first of all we cannot prove those narrations to be from Rasulullah or from Allah or representing the view of Allah and Rasulullah with 100% certainty. We don't, we cannot prove that and we'll show you why. And the second thing is even if you were to accept that they are from Allah and Rasul, he says the wording of these narrations is not sufficient to prove that imama is among the daruriyat of deen. I said, now you will say, but the speaker, the narrations that he was presenting, their wording is very clear. He said, Baba, those narrations, Aslan Sayyidi Shaheed is not even considering them because their chains and their content, when taken holistically, none of them are reliable or acceptable. And I'll show you why. So Sayyidi Shaheed, it's not like Na'udhu Billah, he has a bias against them. At the level of Bahth al Kharij, this is the difference between Bahth al Kharij and street level preaching. When you're pre preaching to the street, to the masses, you can bring narrations from here and there, pick here and there, and then and, and sell your, your, your merchandise, and, and no one's going to object because the public doesn't know any better. 
But when you're at the level of Ayatollah Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, you have some of the brilliant and most brightest students of the Hausa attending your lectures, like people like Ayatollah Sayyid Kazim al Hussein al Ha'iri, Marja Taqlid, uh, and also Ayatollah Sayyid Mahmoud al Hashmi al Shahroodi, brilliant geniuses, Mujtahideen and Maraja like him are attending your classes, then obviously you cannot get away with uh, the narrations, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of narrations that the speaker presents. If you present those narrations to these students, they will tear your argument to pieces. Like, <laughs> these narrations would not be sufficient to prove uh, you know, a low stake claim in the Bab of Fiqh. Here we're talking Aqeedah, the salvation of the entire Ummah. You want to take it away on the basis of narrations, which would not work in a minor Bab of Fiqh. This is what the speaker has done. So in any case, the real reason, and obviously this is not an empty claim that we're making, Sayyidi Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Ayatollah Sayyid Abul Qasim al-Khui, Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, uh, we can actually prove it to you why they make this claim, why they remove imama from the daruriyat of deen and how the narrations that the speaker presents actually would make no difference to what uh, these great maraja and mujtahideen have said. In fact, th these great maraja and mujtahideen have considered these narrations. They are familiar with these narrations, yet they have dismissed the import and the content of these narrations and they have not used them to derive the uh, the claim that imama is among the daruriyat of deen. So obviously at the level of bahth al-kharij, when you want to prove something, you need to have a very robust methodology. Because if you have any weak point in your argument or reasoning, the students, they are full, given full freedom to raise ishkalat, to object, to raise uh, doubts. And obviously if you, if you bring a half-baked case, or rather an extremely poorly baked case like the speaker presents, that is going to be torn apart to pieces at the level of Bahth al-Kharij. You cannot uh, pull wool over their eyes because it's attended by people who are on the way to Ijtihad and some of them are actually already Mujtahideen. So they help out the other students. So in any case, let us go to the narrations now that he then uh, presents. And let's see, because the public as lay people you might still be wondering, that no, the narrations he presented were very clear evidence. So how come Sayyid al-Khui, Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Tabatabai al-Hakim, all these grand maraji, how come they don't give any value to these narrations when they are uh, considering and deliberating on the topic of what is going to be the ruriyat of deen? Why don't they give any importance or ahamiya to, to these narrations? So let's see why. Now, the first narration that he brings is uh, from the book uh, Kamaluddin. So, an indication of the height of unfamiliarity with sources that sometimes is existent among the Ahlul Mimbar is the fact that he first pronounced the name of this book by Sheikh Saduq Karati. He said Kamaluddin and then he got confused. He said Ikmaluddin wa Itmamun Na'ma. Uh, so we have a news flash for him. There is no such book. Sheikh al-Saduq does not have any book entitled Ikmaluddin and Itmamun Na'ma. No, the name of the book is Kamaluddin wa Tamamun Na'ma. It's on the wazn of uh, Ifa'al. It's not on the wazn of Ifa'al. It's not from the bab of Ifa'al as he mistakenly pronounced. Rather, it is on the wazn of Fa'al. So Kamaluddin wa Tamamun Na'ma. And... Uh, this uh, this book by Sheikh Saduq has the narration that he presented. I noticed a very weird methodology that this particular speaker follows in authenticating narrations. And this is something that was really puzzling to me and also to my students who study al Rajal with me. They were really uh, appalled at, at this methodology. It's a really weird and strange methodology. So what he does is that he says we have this narration in Kamaluddin wa Tamamun an nama Of course, he prefaces that by saying that this idea man mata wa lam ya'rif, this has been mentioned in the earliest, highly reliable collections of the classical Shia muhaddithin. So this is the first part of the deception is that emphasizing the idea that is it is mentioned. It, Baba, the fact that something is mentioned in the classical sources doesn't make it correct. There are all kinds of absolute khurafat that have been narrated by Sheikh al-Saduq 
in his books. Yeah, open Ilal al-Shara'i' for example, on the very second page of the book, you will see him narrating a narration, attributing it to Imam Ali bin Abi Talib salam, saying that he, in response to a question by a Jew, Imam Ali salam, who asked him, what is the qarar of the earth? What is the earth, the planet earth? What is it standing on? And na'udhu billah, the narration Sheikh al-Saduq narrates from his teachers all the way up to Amir al-Mu'mineen, the, the sanad he gives. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen responded by saying, the earth is standing, the earth cannot be standing on anything except the shoulder of an angel. And the angel himself is standing, his feet are on a rock. So the angel has feet, he's a human-like angel it seems. And he is standing on a rock. And the rock is balancing on the horns of a bull ala qarni thawr there's a bull with two horns and the the rock supporting the angel is based on the bull the bull itself is standing on a whale fish so this is why when i discuss this narration with my students we call it the fishy fish narration it's a very fishy narration and it is attributed by whom? By Sheikh al Saduq. So don't say, oh, the classical scholars, highly reliable. Sheikh al Saduq. Yes, Baba. Sheikh al Saduq has narrated all kinds of khurafat, absolute lies and fabrications. Obviously, in his time, Bicharo, he didn't know this was a lie because they did, satellites had not gone into space and they hadn't taken pictures of the earth from the space. So you could fool people during that time with these kinds of narrations, which have been attributed to the Imams. Bichara, they thought, the imam, so basically, then the chain of narrators, many liars existed. And this is what we have been uh, screaming throughout the Islah series. This is what we've been alerting people to, is that in the Bahth al-Kharij research, the scholars are themselves, you'll see them screaming, especially Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari, especially because his Bahth al-Kharij lectures are actually recorded. So you can actually go on YouTube and view. You see him screaming, telling the people, Baba, there are absolute fabrications attributed to the Imams. So that's the whole reason why in Bahth al Kharij, this approach of you know bringing out your phone and doing a quick Google search, يعرف, and then the first four four results or five results that Google throws at you, you come and then you present to the public and say, Alhamdulillah, we have proved Imama is from the Dhurriyat of the. So, Baba, this methodology will, <laughs> you will get slaughtered, metaphorically speaking, if you try to use it. Bahth al Kharij, Bahth al Kharij, the Mujtahideen there, and even the students they have studied enough Ilm al Rijal to know. That even if the chain is Sahih, even if Saduq is narrating it, Kulaini, Kulaini's father, Kulaini's brother, doesn't matter. Ya Akhi, we have absolute lies in our books. So just a narration being mentioned in the book, even if it is an old classical book, does not prove it's correct. Number two, it being mentioned even with a Sahih chain, we, we have absolute khurafat that have been narrated with Sahih chain. So this fishy fish narration, it actually also has a Sahih chain for it. Yani, Sahih in the sense that all the uh, narrators have been authenticated by the classical scholars. Yeah, they did not know. At that time, it was not known that this is a lie. So from this, the scholars of Rijal in the modern period have discovered a very dangerous and deadly fact, which is that, okay, so even if the classical scholars authenticate a narrator, that is not 100% proof that he is not a liar. He could be a dangerous, deadly fabricator of hadith, and yet, because his lies were not of the type that were that could be caught at that time, he managed to escape being detected. So now we have to then create, and this is where unfortunately many scholars are lagging behind, is but now we need to create a new list. This is what I've been suggesting for many years, and it's a suggestion that has actually been implemented, but at a very small scale level. So if it had been fully implemented, today we could easily dismiss all these khurafat and fabrications, even sanadan. But the problem is because uh, even the many of the modern scholars, they copy and they simply reproduce what the classical scholars have said without changing it. So then even by their manahij, it becomes difficult to discredit these narrations. And you can see this, for, for example, in the case of the narration which has been given in Mahasin of Al-Barqi, Abu Abdullah Al-Barqi. So we have this uh, narration from him in which he claims that a person came to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali bin Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam, and uh, he said to him that three people, three individuals, have actually proposed to me at the same time. Proposed to me for my daughter, that is. Proposed 
marriage to my daughter. Okay. He said, um, yes, these are the exact words from the riwayah of Mahasin al-Barqi. Mm, okay, so yeah. عن ابن محبوب عن uh, عبد الله بن سنان عن أبي عبد الله عليه السلام okay so this is the chain أحمد بن أبي عبد الله البرقي is narrating from الحسن بن محبوب from عبد الله بن سنان from إمام الصادق عليه السلام and so and he's saying that a person came to Amir al-Mu'minin he said جئتك مستشيرا إن الحسن والحسين uh, وعبد الله بن جعفر خطبوا إلي Hassan, Hussein, and Abdullah bin Jafar have proposed marriage. They have sent a khutbah, a proposal to me, obviously, for my daughter. فقال أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام أمير المؤمنين said المستشار مؤتمن A person who has asked for advice has to give honest advice. أما الحسن فإنه مطلاق He says, Hassan is a serial divorcer. He divorces women like anything. مطلاق is the صيغة of مبالغة نعوذ بالله This is what, and this is narrated in, the, in a classical book, المحاسن And, uh, the interesting thing that I noted in the methodology that I was mentioning of this narrator, of the speaker, is that he follows a very weird methodology in authenticating narration. So, for example, the first narration that he presents from Kamaluddin, what does he do? He doesn't quote the whole Sanat. He, I guess because he knows, or maybe he doesn't know, it's difficult to tell um, until we have gathered all the Qara'in. I think he knows uh, because... In the later narration, he then mentions the full sanat. But in the case of the first narration that he presents, he doesn't mention the sanat. He jumps straight to the top narrator, who is Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, the second naib of the imam. And then he starts telling the people, he's the second naib, he's siqa. And I noticed this as a trend, even in dua al-iftitah. So I was shared another clip and I was asked for my view on it, which I gave to our members, that he's authenticating dua al-iftitah. He's saying the sanat is, is impeccable because... The, the, who is narrating it? It's Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, the second night of the Imam. And then he brings the statement of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari saying that, you know, he, Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri and his son, they are thiqatan, they are trustworthy, reliable, al-ma'munan, you know, you can fully trust them. So now this is basically when we teach al-Murrijal <laughs> to our students, um, I sometimes uh, coin some of my own terminology, graphic, visual terminology, so that they can understand these concepts. As a teacher, you have to sometimes improvise um, terminology that is more graphic, so that they can remember and register in their mind. So when I'm explaining to them the method of authentication in Al Rijal, I talk about the ladder method, which is the standard established method of authenticating narrations, the ladder method. This is the method followed by Sayyid Sistani, Sayyid Al-Khoi. Obviously, they don't call it the land, ladder method. They call it Manaj Sanadi. We, for the simplifying it for our students, we call it the ladder method. Why? Because a Sanad is like a ladder. You have to, when you're authenticating the Sanad, you have to go from the lowest to the highest. And a ladder has several steps. So you go step by step from the bottommost step. You go to the next step, next step, next step. Same thing in the chain. You look at every link. You don't just look at the topmost link. You look at the bottommost link and then where is he taking it from? Then where is he taking it from? Where is he taking it from? And for each and every single person, you have to verify and you have to investigate what the scholars of Rijal have said about this narrator, whether they have verified him, they have vouched for him, whether they have declared him authentic, reliable, trustworthy or not. This uh, speaker, he has a weird and really unprofessional outlandish approach that many would even be forced to suppress their laughter at. When he comes across a narration, especially a narration which the lower chain has got either kathabin or liars or discredited or people or majahil or du'afa in it, you know what he does? He has come up with a very <laughs> ingenious new strategy. Uh, one certainly worthy of, uh, if not the Nobel Prize, in uh, deception and duplicity, then perhaps an Olympic medal. Because the gymnastics that he resorts to is really Olympic in proportions. What he does, as you will see, in the case of both Dua al-Iftita and also the first narration that he presented to prove that man mata, the hadith is sahih. Instead of climbing the ladder as all the scholars of Rijal would do, 
chain by you know link by link step by step he resorts to a method that to explain to my students i was i was forced to use the analogy of an olympic uh, pole vaulting or pole jumping i don't know if you guys are familiar with this sport i myself am not a fan of it but sometimes you catch a glimpse of it on on television you have a, a sportsman and an olympic athlete uh, who has a, a very tall bar in front of him and then he'll use a pole to propel himself and jump over the bar. So instead of following the ladder method, which is you climb the ladder step by step, you verify the links step by step. In the case of the first generation and also in the case of Dua al from bottom, from the ground level, he skips all the lower level narrators. He jumps straight to Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri. And he says, Alhamdulillah, when he jumps to and lands on Muhammad ibn Uthman, he says, oh, he's authentic and reliable. He has been, uh, you know, he has been declared reliable and trustworthy by the 11th Imam. I say, Baba, the 11th Imam, okay, but what about the, the, the narrators at the lower level? How come, no, how come you are not even bothering to, to study them? You have to check each and every single narrator. You can't just jump to the to the top. Otherwise, if we follow this methodology of this lousy and highly unprofessional, unethical one would even say, and duplicitous methodology, we can narrate, we can authenticate all the khurafat, almost all the khurafat. Because very few khurafat actually have liars even at the top. There are such khurafat as well. But there are not too many. Majority of the khurafat, because you see the lower level narrators who are the fabricators, when they used to when they were choosing a primary narrator with whom or to whom to attribute the, the hadith, they would choose someone reliable, especially the clever fabricators. So yes, we had some really dumb fabricators who did not even know which narrators are trustworthy, which narrators are liars. They just attributed left, right and center. So obviously they got caught. But the really smart fabricators whose fabrication survived and they passed the checkpoints. They passed the checkpoints because they put a really trustworthy name at the top. And even more trustworthy is the Imam whom they are attributing to. So if we follow this approach, we can even authenticate the, the previous narration, which we dismissed in the previous uh, refutation that we issued for the hadith of Ta'jil al-Faraj, the Tawqiyah, which uh, promotes du'as for Ta'jil al-Faraj, which is attributed to the 12th Imam. If we were to follow this Olympic pole vaulting or pole jumping methodology, yeah, we can, instead of going through the whole chain, we can just jump straight to Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, who also coincidentally, the, the, the second naib of the 12th Imam, he is coincidentally also the narrator of this tawqiyah. He is the one who says the 12th Imam, apparently at the, at the top of the chain, this is the claim that you find, that he is saying the, the tawqiyah came to me from the 12th Imam, and in that tawqiyah, it is mentioned that the Shia have been exempted from Khumus until the time of Zuhur. So if we take this narration, and we go to the Maraja, using this narration and saying that oh so from today onwards this narration has proved that we don't need to give any hummus to you there is hummus has been waived as an obligation what are the maraja and the mustahideen going to do if you go with this narration <laughs> you're going to be dismissed because but you if you follow the approach of the speaker you say no 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 but the, the narrator of this tawqiyah is muhammad ibn Uthman ibn sa'id al-amri and then you quote to them Obviously, you can fool the awam by making such quotations uh, that Imam al-Hasan al-Askari is authenticated in this. They will tell you, Baba, below him in the chain. Yeah, who do we have? I said, this is where the thief gets caught. This is where then you are left with no hujjah because the narrators below, they have been discredited. Same thing with Dua al -Iftitah. So he's fooling the public and taking them on a ride saying, Oh, Dua al -Iftitah, look, Muhammad ibn Uthman. Say, Baba, Muhammad ibn Uthman, who is taking the narration from him? It is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is a false claimant to Niyaba. In the classical sources, Shaykh al-Tusi and others, they invoke the la'na of Allah on him because he falsely claimed Niyaba of the 12th Imam. So this is why when the expert, the real expert scholars of Ilm al-Rijal, when you ask them, Dua al-Iftitah, Sanad, Sahih or Da'if? They say Sanad is Da'if. say, why? Muhammad ibn Uthman. Muhammad ibn Uthman. Who is taking from Muhammad ibn Uthman? Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. <laughs> Not to be confused with the ISIS guy, no. But yeah, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the narrator of Dua al-Iftitah, has something in common, as I told my fellow members. He has something in common with the Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi of the ISIS. They are both charlatans. They are both frauds. 
this one fraudulently claimed Niyaba. He said, I am the Naib of the 12th Imam. And he was a nephew of Muhammad ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri. He was a nephew of the second Naib. So he, I guess he thought if the second Naib has claimed Niyaba, why not me also? Obviously, after the second Niyaba, Naib had gone. He claimed Niyaba of the 12th Imam. But obviously, he was caught and he was discredited. And they invoke La'na on him. And he is the one taking Dua al iftita He's claiming he's received it from the second naib. So obviously, as serious scholars of Rijal then ask the question, a person who can lie against the 12th Imam and falsely claim Niyaba, how can we trust him when he is conveying something to us from the second naib? Khair, Dua al iftita is a separate bath. We'll go into that, inshallah, if there is time. For now, the first narration that he presents from Kamaluddin, Wa tamamun na'ma, he is saying it is narrated by Muhammad ibn Uthman. He takes that pole, jump straight to the second Nile. We say, come a little bit down. Where is this narration actually coming from? So it's coming from Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Ishaq al Taliqani. So now, what is the status of this narrator? This is what he did not share with the public. This is why, you know, we wonder at the deception and duplicity of these speakers, the way they take the public for long rides, the way they mislead and deceive the public, this is how they do it. So the lower weak aspects of the chain, he ignores. He conveniently brushes under the carpet, he jumps straight to the top. Whereas in Almu Rajal, you're not allowed to do that. You have to go step by step. It's a very meticulous, methodical process. Authenticating narrations, you can authenticate narrations with this approach on the street and fool, you know, laymen with that. But if you go to Bahthul Kharij and you try to pull wool over the eyes of experienced, seasoned, Maraja and Mujtahideen who live and breathe Ilm or Rijal, obviously you're going to get humiliated. It's going to be very embarrassing if you try to use narrations like them. So now I hope you're beginning to understand why the top Maraja and Mujtahideen, they don't use narrations like this to include Imam among the Daruriyat ad deen They don't look at a narration like this and follow the approach of the speaker and say, Oh, Muhammad ibn Uthman, ibn Sa'id al-Amri, second Nayab, narrating from his father, narrating from Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Askari is okaying the narration. He's saying, yes, this narration is true. So we accept it and let us include it daruriyat of deen. No, my dears. The maraji and mustahidin at the top level would say, show us the whole chain. And once they see the whole chain, they will tell you, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Ishaq. You only need to go to the Mu'jam, Rijal al-Hadith. Wa Tafsil Tabaqati Ruwad, the 24 volume encyclopedia of Ayatollah al Uzma Sayyid Abul Qasim al Khoui. In this encyclopedia, he has mentioned very clearly the status of this narration has been given. Very, uh, the status of this narrator in particular has been laid out very clearly. Uh, this is what Ayatollah Sayyid Abul Qasim al Khoui says. This is volume 15, page 231. He says, he talks about this particular narrator and he says that, yes, we can accept that he was a Shia, his Aqeedah may even have been good, but this is where you understand the difference between a uh, someone who is not well versed in Almur Rijal and someone who is well versed in Almur Rijal. A person, a lay person, he would see something like, you know, a claim that this person was a good Shia, he was a pious believer maybe, or he was a nice person. And he says, okay, so let's take his narrations. Atullah Khoi, no. He says, Amma wathaqatuhu. He says, wathaqa is a different thing. Just because someone is outwardly pious or someone, let's say, has good aqidah does not mean he cannot transmit khurafat. It's possible that he was fooled by someone else. It's possible this, it's possible. There's so many possibilities you have to confront. So the question if we ask Sayyidul Khui, can we take narrations from this man, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim? He says, amma wathaqatuhu fahiya lam tathbut. As far as his trustworthiness in transmitting narrations is concerned, it is not established and therefore he is majhul. If you want to see the actual explicit uh, statement of him being majhul, uh, it is here. He says, فَلَمْ تَثْبُتْ وَثَاقَتُهُ And that's why Ayatollah Sheikh Muhammad Al-Jawahiri in Al-Mufid uh, min Mu'jam Rijal Al-Hadith in his entry on uh, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, he writes, he is majhulun. He is an unverified and therefore, he stands discredited. You cannot accept or take narrations from him. And then Sayyid al khui responds to another possible shubha that some lax scholars of Rijal can raise. There are some uh, scholars of Rijal, particularly in Qum, some of them very lax. So you have different methodologies in al Rijal. Some methodologies are strict, like that of Sayyid al khui Even more strict is the methodology of Sayyid Sistani. And then you have some methodologies that are very relaxed. 
they and some of them actually involve in what what I call them when I teach my students I actually call them intellectual gymnastics because that's what they are so one such strategy with Sayyid al-Khui is demolishing here uh, which actually is a kind of intellectual uh, gymnastics but Sayyid al-Khui rejects it because it doesn't make sense and it's completely baseless is the idea of authenticating a narrator on the basis of Saduq Taraddi that Sheikh is Saduq because he did Taraddi of him Taraddi means after mentioning the name of a narrator, if Sheikh al-Saduq says Radhi Allahu Anhu, so some scholars say that, well, because Saduq is doing Taraddi, he's saying, may Allah be pleased with him, then the fact that Saduq is praying for him in this manner, maybe we can take this as an indication that he must have been a reliable person. As Sayyid al-Khui says, this is absolutely false because وَلَيْسَ فِي تَرَضِّ الصَّدُوقِ قُدِّسَ سِرُّهُ عَلَيْهِ دَلَالَةٌ عَلَى الْحُسْنِ فَضْلًا عَنِ الْوَثَاقَ You cannot prove the trustworthiness and reliability of a narration just by Saduq Taraddi on it. And we agree with Sayyid al-Khui on this. Sometimes we have students when they ask why, on what grounds should we uh, agree with Sayyid al-Khui and, and reject the claim of those who try to authenticate on the basis of Taraddi. The simple answer I usually give is Sayyid al-Saduq has done Taraddi on narrators who have transmitted absolute fabricated khurafat that we know 100% today they are khurafat so for example the narration that I mentioned uh, the one where someone comes to Imam Ali السلام, the Yahudi, the Jew, he comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he says akhbirni among a series of questions that he asks he says akhbirni an qarar al-ardi tell me what is the earth standing on ala ma huwa on what is the earth standing on so the Imam, na'uzu billah, this is a fabricated narration, but the primary narrator is Ali ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad radiyallahu anhu, Shaykh al-Saduq in Ilal al-Shara'ir, this is page 2 of Ilal al-Shara'ir, Alamu Majlisi also mentions this narration in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 10, page 12, but the primary source is Shaykh al-Saduq, Alamu Majlisi is simply taking it from Shaykh al-Saduq. So he says, an Ali ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad radiyallahu anhu, the Shaykh who is narrating this narration is radiyallahu anhu, Shaykh Saduq does taraddi on him. Yet look at the absolute fabrication that he is narrating. What is he narrating? That Amir al-Mu'mineen was asked by Yahudi, what is the earth standing on? And he said, أَمَّا قَرَارُ هَذِهِ الْأَرْضِ لَا يَكُنُ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ عَاتِقِ This The foundation of this earth, this earth cannot stand on anything except the shoulder of an angel. Okay. وَقَدَمَا ذَلِكَ الْمَلِكَ عَلَىٰ صَفْرَةً the, the two feet of that angel are, are on a rock. So this is an anthropomorphic angel. He has feet and he is balancing his feet on the rock. So apparently his wings, he's not using them. He's balancing himself on his feet. The feet are on a sakhra, on a rock. And the rock is on the horns of a bull. And the limbs of the, the bull or the buffalo are on the back of a whale fish in the lowest sea. So apparently there is a sea outside this earth, beneath this earth, there is also a sea. And uh, the uh, buffalo is on, on a whale fish that is inside that lowest sea. And then, so the important part is that if you are going to authenticate narratives on the basis of Sheikh Saduq's taraddi on them, just because Sheikh al-Saduq says, Allah anhu, you are going to take this as evidence of wasaqa, then also authenticate this narration, my friend. This narration is also narrated from the Sheikh of Saduq, on whom he does taraddi. He says, An Ali ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad, radiyallahu anhu. So I think this narration is sufficient to demolish completely the claim that those on whom Saduq does taraddi must be reliable. No, as you can see, people on whom Saduq is doing taraddi, they are narrating absolute khurafat, and absolute lies and fabrications and attributing to them to to the imams so that is why my dear brothers and sisters when this speaker comes and says that Sheikh al-Saduq has narrated this narration from uh, Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri we say how did he how did you get to Muhammad ibn Uthman you went through Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Ishaq al-Taliqani who is Majhul and the moment a Majhul narrator appears in the chain as per the manhaj of Sayyid al-Khui and Sayyid al-Sistani, the narration immediately becomes da'if. They don't use such narrations in fiqh. Unless you can bring qara'in 
qat'iyya to support it or qara'in kharijiyya which in this case you don't have any because we will see if the qara'in the qara'in you are bringing they are also of the same level of weakness and it doesn't help you because to strengthen weakness you need strength as you need a strong sahih narration to strengthen the weakness you don't you cannot strengthen weakness with weak narrations because then you will, all you'll get is compounded weakness so in any case and in the matter of aqidah as i already told you before you can even have uh, 10 sahih narrations you can still not prove aqidah 